Nancy, you're such a voice for us when it comes to artificial intelligence, whether it's hype or reality. And I'm interested as to whether you think the second half will bode well if you're long some of these names like NVIDIA and the chip stocks. Well, look, trees don't grow to the sky, so we need to recognize that these stocks have run a lot uh, already. Uh, having said that, you know, NVIDIA's got a lot of its leave in terms of new product development, right? We've got uh, Blackwell coming on in 2025. Uh, we've got uh, Ruben uh, thereafter. Uh, and so there's quite a lot of product development. Uh, NVIDIA does enjoy a competitive moat in both software uh, and hardware. And, and I think we're just beginning uh, of the purchase of these, uh, these GPU chips from governments uh, and other sectors like healthcare, uh, the automotive sector. Uh, so look, uh, at the end of the day, when a stock has risen 150%, uh, there can always be a pullback. Uh, but I would say we're still pretty early uh, innings here uh, on the NVIDIA story. Nancy, we've done a lot on the show of late about how difficult it is, particularly for the sell side, to forecast top line growth. You talked about Blackwell coming online. But you're in the camp of people that says Gen AI is going to change everything, but it's not yet priced in. Uh, which sectors is it not yet priced in for? Where is that not yet being reflected? Well, I think given what we've seen uh, in the first quarter and the second quarter, uh, in particular the United States, the second quarter all led uh, by the magnificent five, so to speak. You know, Apple and Tesla obviously lagged a bit, uh, but it was tech, tech and tech. And so I would say that Gen AI has been priced in to a certain extent to those stocks. They certainly are recognized uh, as Gen AI beneficiaries. But I think the interesting thing uh, is, um, you know, Gen AI is value added across every sector of the economy, or at least that's what we think. Uh, and therefore, looking ahead, uh, we think Gen AI and its implications for innovation, cost savings, productivity improvements in other parts of the economy uh, is not yet priced in. And in any event, our view uh, is that earnings growth will broaden and deepen as the year progresses. It's still about tech in the second quarter, by the way, but as the year progresses, uh, and we think that will lead to a broadening uh, in market participation. So actually many of our managers, remember we're open architecture at Alti Tiedemann, uh, have been reducing uh, technology to the benefit to other sectors of the economy that will over time benefit from Gen AI, but also uh, we think we'll see an acceleration in earnings growth as the year progresses and frankly, uh, trade on a more attractive valuation. Really important when it comes to publicly traded equities, Nancy. Well, what's so great about you is we can go cross asset as well and to private assets and to non-public companies. It's interesting, we on recently had Yuma Crossing Capital Advisors head on recently who've done a partnership with Alti Tiedemann to look at well, private companies from an equity perspective, but you're looking at it from a debt perspective as well. Where should one be allocating into technology or more broadly? So um, in technology and more broadly, let's just take private credit by way of example. Uh, we think private credit is super interesting because there's a retrenchment happening on the part of the banks. Now, you all saw the stress test last week. Banks need more capital. Uh, Basel III will be punitive uh, in terms of ongoing capital requirements. There's mark-to-market pressures uh, on bank balance sheets. Uh, and of course, small to medium-sized banks, uh, commercial banks uh, that have uh, very high exposure to the commercial real estate uh, sector have been withdrawing from lending, not to mention funding costs going up. Okay, so what's happening here? Banks are retrenching from lending, uh, but marquee credit names uh, are coming in and filling uh, the void. Uh, we initially invested uh, in what are called private lending, direct lending strategies. More recently, uh, we're evolving and moving into what I call asset-backed lending strategies. Again, these are kind of almost investment grade or in another name investment grade, senior secured, high up in the capital structure, uh, and direct lending is about a 2% premium uh, to high yield, uh, whereas asset-backed lending is about a 4% uh, premium to high yield. And, and by the way, these are being okay. offered uh, to wealth channels in sort of semi-liquid form. So it's not hugely illiquid, and that's important as well. Nancy, how is a presidential election in the United States going to impact the technology sector? Wow. Well, the presidential election in the United States got rather entertaining uh, last Thursday in a sort of cringe uh, way, dare I say. Uh, you know, we've got a long way to go here 
uh, before we know uh, whether either candidate or uh, obviously if there's a replacement for Biden remains to be seen. Uh, but look, I think tech companies remain strong. Neither candidate is anti-tech. They both recognize this is a significant competitive advantage uh, to the United States. I don't see IRA or the CHIPS Act being rolled back under either candidate, clearly uh, not if President Biden uh, wins. And these are all important uh, supports for the tech sector. Um, that, in addition to the fact that these technology companies, uh, you know, are spending huge amounts uh, on Gen AI, $200 billion, the four largest tech companies, of course, their CapEx is uh, NVIDIA's revenue. Uh, and so we, we think that continues irrespective of who wins the election. Now, this is a sector that's not really impacted by the election. This is a real secular trend here. The artificial intelligence wave has boosted the value of tech companies around the world this year, but one firm has surpassed them all. NVIDIA. 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 The surge in demand for NVIDIA's highly sought after chips has made it the hottest stock on Wall Street. And on the 18th of June, the rally propelled it to the title of the world's most valuable company. NVIDIA has more than doubled, more than tripled year to date. It's astounding. Right now, $3.35 trillion market value. It's added $2.1 trillion in market value this year. That's more than Amazon. That's more than Meta. That's more than Berkshire Hathaway. But just days later, the stock price plunged. The only thing that everyone is talking about is NVIDIA. It follows three straight days of declines, which total more than 10%, so therefore a technical correction. In just three days of trading, $430 billion was wiped off the AI chip giant's market cap. It was the biggest value loss over that period for any company in history. And the whole episode has left analysts scratching their heads as to how much the tech giant should really be worth. I think it's really difficult to really ascertain what the you know total addressable market really is for artificial intelligence. It used to be sort of a, a rule of thumb when I was growing up in this business that you know anything over 10 times price to sales was just too expensive. So here's why Nvidia is so hard to price right now. Joining us now to discuss is Matt Turner who leads Bloomberg's US equities coverage. Matt, great to have you with us. So the standard way that we think about valuing firms is on price to earnings, share prices versus earnings per share. But that's tricky for NVIDIA. Why? Yeah, it, it's very difficult for NVIDIA in the sense that the company itself has really transformed itself in the last couple of years. So if, if we want to take a step back and look at the before, I mean, it was primarily selling these GPUs to power computer graphics, it sort of was used in the crypto space back in the 2021, 2022 days. And now it's obviously it's been flipped into the generative AI name that everybody's looking at. And that has really led to explosive growth in the company's sales. And that creates a headache for analysts and for the company itself in terms of projecting what they're going to make on a quarter by quarter basis. And so you have to look at the company now and you also have to look at where it's going to be in a year and two years and three years. And that's very difficult to do for a market like the AI industry, which I don't know if we want to say that it's new, but it's definitely become the hottest thing right now. And so it, it creates a headache for how big it's going to be, how fast it's going to grow. And analysts are sort of grappling with how to create those projections. Sometimes they look at historical growth for the company and for NVIDIA that has a 30 year history, this is completely different than anything it's ever really seen outside of its early days of growth. So it's just like a very difficult time to see, is this going to continue or is it going to flatten out or even, you know, is it going to taper off and start to decline? Yeah, I mean, certainly, even if you think about the conversations we were having about AI just six months ago, even that has, seems completely transformed. How are analysts putting a price range on NVIDIA at the moment? Some of the ones that we've talked to have said that there's, for lack of a better word, they're ballparking it, right? They're looking at the company's own guidance where the company will give projections for their revenue and they'll say, we're going to make $24 billion next quarter, roughly. And analysts will take that and they'll say, we think that they will make around that. But based off of their last few quarters, they're adding two, three, four billion dollars on top of that because they're not even sure. The the supply and demand for the chips themselves is, is as I said, it's explosive at this point. And so they're basically looking at that and they're trying to guess, are we going to be 
fifteen percent above what the company thinks? Are we going to be in line with what the company thinks? And if you look at the last five quarters, the company itself has undershot its own sort of sales that it's reported by about thirteen percent, which is big. You look at a company like Apple or Meta and Facebook, and they typically beat or miss their own guidance by about two percent. So compare that to a to a thirteen percent beat or miss rate. It's a pretty massive gap, especially for a company the size of Nvidia at this point. Yeah, I mean, it sounds a bit like a guessing game, an educated guessing game, but a bit of a guess nonetheless. We're a couple of days out from that massive share price drop. Was that linked to the difficulty of valuing NVIDIA? It's difficult to say. I mean, I would say yes. Analysts and investors and fund managers are all questioning how to value the stock and has it gotten too big. But you look back a couple of years, NVIDIA was a $500 billion stock, which don't get me wrong, that's a very large company, relatively speaking, but becoming from $500 billion to the world's largest company at over $3 trillion, yeah, Quite I mean, a glow up. It, it is. And, and people are questioning whether it's worth that. And so the price decline, a lot of it from people that we've talked to is because of that. People were getting worried whether it's gotten ahead of itself in terms of the run-up, whether it can, in the future, make enough money and sell enough of these chips to back up the $3 trillion valuation that it was at. In the last few days, investors got nervous as to whether or not they were going to be able to live up to that sort of hype. So that that's sort of why we, we saw the, pu- the pullback in recent days. So to make an AI analogy then, how are analysts learning and projecting about how NVIDIA's stock price will look in the future? What sort of clues do the, the forward price to earnings ratio give us as to what might be the future direction of the stock? Yeah, I mean, they, they will use it to try and project out. Right now, it's trading around, it's a, a, a 40 times multiple. So that's something that analysts will use to compare it to itself versus history. They'll compare it to other companies. And one of the things that we hear from a lot of people is that's expensive relative to most companies on the S&P 500. They will essentially look at that and say, can it trade at a higher level than this? Can it trade at 80 times earnings? Can it trade at 100 times earnings? And then they'll look at the price and they will sort of extrapolate that out. They will essentially put their price targets on it and say, we think that this could trade at 60 times earnings, which equals a, for example, a $200 price target, which an analyst recently came out in the last few weeks with that exact price target, which would put the company at close to $5 trillion in the next year, which is massive. It's not that often that we get to reference middle-aged, uh, middle, <laughs> middle-aged mathematicians, maybe, but not mathematicians in the Middle Ages. But with, I'm talking about Fibonacci, a word that some of our listeners may only have heard in the Da Vinci Code, but I'm wondering how much the, the Fibonacci retracement level plays into this, and, and if you can explain it for those that don't know it. Sure, yeah. It's, it, it is uh, a very complicated math formula that I will not try to explain, but at its core, it's something that traders and, and analysts use to sort of analyze price moves. They look at it and they tend to say these levels correspond with what they would consider support. So if the stock is falling, they will look at one of these so-called retracement levels and they will say, you know, we think that the stock is going to reach this level. And then investors will, based off of history, based off of other technical analysts viewpoints, they will say that the stock is going to bounce off of that level. And that's actually something that we've seen with NVIDIA stock itself. You see it with a lot of other stocks. Again, technical analysis is a, a hot topic among traders and investors. Some people believe that it's really an art form. Some people believe that it's just like magic and is not very real. It's very divisive among traders. Depends on who you ask, but if you look at the charts, especially with NVIDIA recently, those retracement levels have acted as support levels for the stock, which has lent some credence to the validity of using them to project where the stock is going to go from here. And once again, I realize the Italians can teach us so much. Matt Turner, thank you so much for joining us. Matt leads our coverage of US equities.